our featured speaker, Dr. Nick Sines. Tonight's event is part of our Borderlands of Southern Colorado project, which is a collaboration between three of History Colorado's Southern Colorado museums, El Pueblo History Museum, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, and the Trinidad History Museum. The project explores the borderlands history of the Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico region through a variety of exhibits, lectures, educational activities, and now, beginning tonight, online programming. Tonight's program is the first in a series of online lectures and discussions that we plan to offer while our museums are temporarily closed to the public. To learn more about future topics, please stick around for our concluding remarks after Dr. Sine's presentation, where we'll give you a sneak peek of programs and topics uh, that are coming up over the next several weeks. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to also thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area for their generous support of the Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series. Without the support of the Heritage Area and other donors, programs like these would not be possible. We invite you this evening to support future museum programming by clicking on the Colorado Gives link in the chat box, which um, should be there at this time. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Sines. Dr. Sines is a professor of history at Adams State University. He's the president of the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, and he's a good friend and collaborator to History Colorado. Dr. Sines has been a partner with us on our Borderlands project since our very first scholar and community convening back in, I believe it was April 2017. Dr. Sines' talk tonight is entitled ANSA in the Borderlands, Conflict and Coalition. At the conclusion of his presentation, he will take questions from the audience, so feel free to type questions into the chat box. So with that, uh, Nick, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing here. Hopefully you should have seen a switch in the slides. I was noticing in the chat bar, it looks as though uh, a few people might have some difficulty hearing. It might be the issue that uh, the uh, device that you're using might need the volume uh, turned up, but it does appear as though sound is working uh, through Zoom. So as uh, Eric was mentioning uh, about Three years ago, there was a convening uh, of scholars uh, to think about the, the future of History Colorado, next steps with regards to programming uh, and, and where to go. Uh, and it was entitled, uh, the symposium was entitled, uh, The Borderlands of Southern Colorado. Uh, and what I'm doing today is kind of a continuation of some ideas uh, that were started uh, as part of uh, that original symposium all that all that time ago, uh, but looking at the borderlands as uh, a different sort of historical framework uh, from the frontier history that is usually the framework used to talk about uh, the history of the West. So if the frontier is about binaries of, of one group conquering another, um, the borderlands is a more complex, uh, fluid, and shifting place. Uh, to kind of frame what I'm talking about, uh, I want to first start with a, a quote from Pekka Hamalinen uh, and Samuel Truitt, uh, two scholars who have written uh, on this concept. Uh, they write, if frontiers are places where we once told our master American narratives, then borderlands are the places where those narratives come unraveled. They are ambiguous and often unstable realms where boundaries are also crossroads, peripheries are also central places, homelands are also passing through places, and the endpoints of empire are also forks in the road. If frontiers are spaces of narrative closure, then borderlands are places where stories take unpredictable turns and rarely end as expected. They go on to say, let's see if I can switch slides here. There we go. Uh, they go on to talk about uh, some of the themes and, and sort of stories that appear in Borderlands history. Uh, tales of economic exchange, uh, of cultural mixing, and political contestation. So not stories of isolation, but rather histories of cultures colliding and interacting with one another. They go on to say that these are histories anchored in spatial mobility. Uh, so looking at 
change over time uh, and how people adjust to uh, movement uh, and, and shifting boundaries and frontiers. Uh, situational identity, so the way in which one person's role within society uh, might shift depending on their geographic location or sense of place. Local contingency, uh, kind of related to that uh, as well, not just in a sense of uh, class and social hierarchy, uh, but also of uh, the specific uh, context in which that person lives. And also ambiguities of power. And I think this particular theme is particularly uh, instructive for how to think about Anza uh, and his role within the history that I'm looking at uh, for the purposes of this evening. So, let's see here, I can advance the slide again. Uh, some of you might be wondering who Anza uh, was. Uh, Anza is a, a personality from uh, the history of 18th century uh, Spanish New Mexico and the, the larger Spanish Southwest. Um, really a product of this borderland environment. Grew up uh, in a family that was on the Sonoran uh, borderland uh, with the, the communities to the north. Uh, in California, he is perhaps best known uh, for leading an, an overland route into uh, the Bay Area. So the, the first mission community settled in California is San Diego de Alcala in 1769. Uh, within about five years, there's a hope to uh, provision California overland, so not having to rely on uh, boats uh, and the ocean. Uh, and so he kind of pioneers that route. He then follows that up in 1775, 1776 uh, with an overland route that includes uh, settlers. Um, and then shortly after that, he's appointed as the Spanish governor uh, of New Mexico, a, a position he holds for about 10 years. And his role in all of this uh, is largely seen to be uh, stopping the threat posed by the Comanche Empire uh, to not only New Mexico uh, and the Spanish colony there, uh, but the very communities that surround uh, Spanish New Mexico and which in some form or another uh, are sort of informally allied or uh, to some degree uh, directly influenced by the presence of the Spanish. So this kind of gets to the, the problem or the sort of curiosity that I have for tonight. Uh, we tend to talk about the 1779 uh, excursion into what is today Colorado as Anza's expedition or Anza's campaign, uh, really attributing a high degree of agency to the role of Anza in uh, constructing this campaign uh, and facilitating its ultimate success. Uh, but if you notice uh, on the slide I have presented here, that campaign includes a really varied cast of characters, 645 persons in all, uh, though I should say that the numbers vary a little bit depending on the source. Uh, among that number, there are persons who identify as Spaniards. There are some persons who identify as being Henisero, uh, or that is a sort of person uh, of, uh, of a Christianized identity, but from a native ancestry. Uh, a number of persons who identify as uh, part of one of the Pueblo communities uh, from along the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the Utes that I'll be talking about in particular, and also uh, the Hikaria uh, Apache who joined the campaign uh, as it's already underway. So uh, we can't really call this strictly a Spanish expedition or a Spanish campaign. Uh, and so part of what I'm trying to do with uh, the history of this particular episode from history is think about this as a uh, plural moments uh, or a plural social gathering in which we have a kind of coalition uh, working together uh, against what is perceived to be a common threat, namely the Comanche. So this is the map produced uh, by cartographer Bernardo de Miera y Pacheco uh, in 1779, uh, essentially detailing uh, the, the, the trip that is taken from Santa Fe northward into again what is today Colorado. So if you look on the map, and I'm going to move my cursor over, uh, you'll notice uh, a sort of prominent feature in the middle of the map. Uh, it appears in the map uh, to the right uh, down at the very bottom. Uh, that is San Antonio Mountain in the San Luis Valley. It's pretty prominent on the south end. Um, so the sort of detail that is on the right uh, roughly shows where the Colorado, New Mexico border is today. It's actually just north uh, of San Antonio Mountain. So when I'm moving the cursor right now in the detail essentially shows uh, where the Colorado, New Mexico border is today. You'll notice there is uh, a route coming through the San Juan Mountains. Uh, in fact, it kind of looks like they're in the middle of the San Juan Mountains. What they're doing is staying very close uh, to the foothills uh, of the San Juan Mountains. 
Uh, they cut through the San Luis Valley, where my cursor is, is essentially today uh, Sawatch County, through Pancha Pass. Uh, they make it roughly around uh, where Salida and Buena Vista are today. Uh, it's not exactly clear how they cut through the mountains again, but probably through what is today referred to as Ute Pass. Uh, there are some Utes, I'll talk about that more in a moment, who are accompanying the expedition, so they would have been charting uh, a path. They cut possibly through the southern end of South Park, out of the Rocky Mountains, and into uh, the Eastern Plains. It's there, I'm gonna move my chat bar over here real quick. Uh, it's there uh, that they encounter um, first, uh, a uh, settlement uh, or a small set of, of teepees that do not have any uh, fighting age uh, men. Uh, there, there is what some historians describe as a massacre. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, there is a, a second engagement with uh, the Comanche uh, leader Cuerno Verde and a group of uh, warriors who were actually returning from a raid that they had made on Taos. So simultaneous to this uh, expedition of sorts, this campaign, uh, the Comanches are also attacking Taos and it's on their return that they encounter uh, the combined uh, Spanish, uh, Pueblo, Ute, and Apache uh, group, very close to what is modern day Pueblo, uh, although a little bit south of it. So the account says uh, the Rio San Carlos, there is a St. Charles River today and that's essentially where uh, the battle takes place. They then uh, return. Uh, so if you notice where my cursor is going, essentially into what is today the wet valley around where the border is between Huerfano and Custer County, uh, over Sangre de Cristo Pass, uh, so just north of Fort Garland, and then down in return uh, close to what is today San Luis and eventually to Taos and from Taos back to Santa Fe. So they do a very big loop up into uh, Colorado. It's one of the first uh, clearly documented in instances in which there are Spanish uh, in Colorado. It's probably the case that there are, are frequent uh, forays of the Spanish into Colorado, uh, but we don't have very frequent documentation of that. This is one of the few instances in which this is uh, very clearly the case. So uh, moving forward, uh, just some things to think about here. Uh, this is a, an evolving world where there's a lot of different uh, alliances and partnerships and relationships being won and lost. Uh, the Comanche are closely allied with the Utes uh, up until about 1750, at which point, uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, uh, the Utes and the Comanches have a sort of separation. So, so although the early stage of imperial expansion uh, on the part of uh, Comancheria uh, was in part facilitated or aided by the Utes, by about 1750 there's a falling out, uh, the Utes seem to have uh, now uh, fallen on the, 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 the opposite side of the Comanches, uh, and this allows for the Utes ultimately to start working with the Spanish. Uh, into the 1760s and into the 1770s, uh, the Comanches are relentless in attacking Pueblo after Pueblo, uh, Spanish rancho after rancho. Um, some of these Pueblos are actually fortified at around this time, so famously there are uh, turrets established around Pecos Pueblo uh, to stave off continued uh, attack by the Comanche. Uh, according to one historian, um, whether or not the Comanche actually conquer New Mexico in this time period isn't so much a, ma a matter of historical fact as perspective, right? So looking from the vantage of the Comanche in this time period, essentially they, they make New Mexico part of their Comancheria. Uh, the Spanish, by some measure, are really frustrated in their attempts uh, to stave off the expansion of the Comanche, uh, although they never really sort of acknowledge that the Comanche have overpowered them. In the midst of this, uh, there's also, of course, the Pueblo communities there that the Spanish are trying to claim some sway over uh, and also to some degree provide protection uh, as part of their colony. Uh, the Jicaria Apache had lived uh, along the Arkansas River up until about the 1720s, but they are forced uh, away from the Comanche and into New Mexico as refugees as Comancheria expands southward. So th th there's a, a sort of shifting landscape here of people moving about, uh, of new alliances uh, being formed as old ones are being broken. That is sort of the backstory to what happens in 1779. Um, Ultimately, what happens in 1779 is not the only time in which there's sort of this mixed partnership. So famously in 1760, there was an attack 
uh, on uh, the Pueblo of, of Taos uh, and surrounding uh, Spanish ranchos. Uh, the then governor, uh, Marín del Valle, uh, mobilized, according to the records, as many as 1,000 Spaniards, Pueblos, and Utes to attack uh, the Comanches. Supposedly, they spend weeks in the field. Uh, they never find any Comanches. And so although they're able to mobilize this massive army, um, it is ultimately ineffective at reversing uh, the, the, the tide in 1760. 1774 is really among the very worst years uh, of the Comanche expansion into New Mexico. There are attacks on Picari Pueblo, uh, on Nambe Pueblo. In Santa Cruz, both the Pueblo and also the neighboring Spanish uh, settlement of Santa Cruz de la Cañada are attacked. And then uh, a few weeks later, simultaneously, uh, Albuquerque and, and Pecos Pueblo uh, are attacked. The, the image I have there I should note is of Pecos Pueblo, but that's not actually one of these defensive turrets. That's that what's re what remains uh, of the mission church. Uh, but shortly after all these attacks, uh, the, the governor uh, charges Carlos Fernandez uh, with sending a punitive expedition against uh, the Comanche. So this is 1774. Um, some of what we know about this uh, excursion, this campaign uh, relates to the, the famous ballad Los Comanches, so it's sort of wrapped up in myth and fiction and it's hard from a historical vantage to extrapolate uh, fact uh, out, of, out of some of that history, but we do have some uh, accounts written from military personnel. It appears, although it's impossible to confirm, uh, that the Fernandez group encounters the Comanches uh, at the Spanish peaks or, or somewhere near to the Spanish peaks in what is today uh, Huerfano and, and Las Animas counties. Uh, there they supposedly kill uh, a figure known as Cuerno Verde uh, or uh, Greenhorn. Uh, just north, of course, of the Spanish peaks, there is a mountain that bears the name uh, Greenhorn, which is the English translation for Cuerno Verde. It appears as though this particular leader had a headdress uh, with a single buffalo horn. Uh, why it was associated with green is unclear, but there are frequent references in the sources to this Cuerno Verde. There is supposedly a Cuerno Verde who's killed at Ojo Caliente in 1768. Uh, the one who is encountered on the battlefield in 1774 uh, is supposedly also killed and has the same name. Uh, and then Anza encounters either a third uh, or possibly what is still just a second Cuerno Verde uh, just outside of Pueblo in 1779. So we don't know exactly how many personalities the Spanish uh, granted this name to. Uh, Cuerno Verde kind of looms large in the Spanish documents from this time period uh, as the leader of a, a frequent uh, series of attacks, and yet uh, we don't know much uh, about the actual man. Much of the, uh, the history is, is shrouded in uh, the, the mythology associated with him. Uh, I mentioned these two previous uh, campaigns to stress that what happens in 1779 isn't ne necessarily all that exceptional. Uh, the Spanish are repeatedly working with uh, other groups uh, to try to mobilize a, a common front, a, a coalition of sorts against the Comanches to stave off the worst of their predations. Um, but ultimately what happens in 1779 gives us more insight because Anza keeps a journal. Uh, and what I want to do now is walk through some of the, the more interesting moments from the journal that I think get at some of the sort of borderland themes that I started this, this talk with. So the first excerpt uh, from 1779 is not long after the campaign has gotten underway. Uh, it's dated August 20th, which happens to be a Friday. Um, and I'm using the uh, Ron Kessler English translation here. Um, so the, the journal entry uh, by the hand of Anza scribe reads, uh, late that afternoon, 200 men joined me, Yutas and Apaches, with four chiefs of the former, with supplications that since they were friends, I should allow them to join me, and since we were on a campaign against the Comanches, I conceded to their requests as much for that reason as to see whether we could civilize them, so that at least they could be useful against the same enemies as up to now. With this in mind, I told them that if they placed themselves at my orders, they would share in the spoils, if any, with the exception of any personal prisoners, on an equal basis with my people, to which confiscation they agreed and offered to abide by them. So some really interesting things going on here, right? The, the, the Spanish and Pueblo campaign is already underway. 
uh, it appears as though this entry is uh, or, or was uh, recorded around what is modern day Antonito. So roughly where is Antonito, Colorado today, this uh, Spanish uh, force, which is already on the march north from Santa Fe, encounters this group of, of Yutas and Apaches. Um, it's not clear from the sources if they were told about this campaign already or they just happened to be there. It's most likely the case that they had watched uh, the, the force leaving Santa Fe and, and to choose to join up with it here. Uh, notably, uh, Anza is sort of hinting at the hope that he might be able to integrate through civilization, uh, these communities into the fold of Spanish New Mexico, which I think points uh, to the extent to which these groups hadn't really fully been integrated into Spanish New Mexico. Supposedly the Jicaria Apache were allowed to settle within Spanish New Mexico because they would Christianize themselves, that is undergo baptism and become part, part of the fold uh, of Christianity in New Mexico. But this entry suggests that that's not quite happening. It could also suggest that Anza is hopeful that his superiors reading his report uh, are gonna say uh, essentially that uh, Anza is trying to do God's work and the work of the empire in bringing this group into the fold uh, of Spanish New Mexico. Uh, notably here though, uh, Anza says that he's going to share on equal terms with these groups uh, whatever spoils might be gained uh, from the encounter with the Comanches. That's also telling insofar as what we don't see happening here is Anza trying to exercise sort of a superior relationship uh, with these two groups. If anything, he recognizes the utility of having the Utes and the Apaches join his campaign. Uh, they know the terrain much better than him. Uh, they can offer uh, direction uh, and scouts to locate the Comanches. Uh, and so Anza is acknowledging uh, at some level in the journal here, uh, the extent to which the Spanish really aren't uh, in a position of authority or control in this region. They're actually relying uh, upon these two indigenous groups uh, and the persons that make up this force of about 200 man, men, which is substantial in order to pull off this campaign. Just five days later, uh, probably close to what is today uh, Del Norte, Colorado, uh, there's another entry that I have here dated August 5th, which happened to be a Wednesday. Uh, Anza writes, at nightfall, we resumed our march toward the Northeast for one league, after which we went two more leagues towards the North Northwest, uh, then uh, here more toward the Northwest, coming to a creek that we name San Ginés. That's, that's today Kerber Creek near Villa Grove. Uh, he continues, notwithstanding the fact that up to this place we had always marched using advanced spies, I have decided that from now on it will be done more carefully and further ahead, in consequence of which 15 left today to reunite uh, on the 29th. So he seems to be suggesting here that he's sending out scouting parties. Uh, what's likely the case here is that these are actually Utes and Apaches that are being sent in advance of the main column. Um, if that's the case, it's very clearly an indication that Anza is relying upon uh, these indigenous uh, persons to uh, essentially manage and direct the movement uh, of the, the column uh, through the San Luis Valley. And importantly here, at well, uh, here as well, uh, he mentions that uh, the march is underway at nighttime, all uh, right? So only at nightfall do they begin. Uh, that kind of suggests that uh, the, the, what, what's going on there is, is essentially the Spanish trying to cover their tracks, trying to avoid creating a major dust cloud uh, that would be visible uh, during the daytime. So they're trying to sneak up uh, on the Comanches. They're trying to use the element of surprise. So again, here too, we see in the sense the Spanish are not this powerful, you know, all powerful, re all reckoning force that is going to go and subdue these rebellious Comanches, if anything. Uh, the Spanish are approaching the situation from a position of uh, weakness. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to use uh, the indigenous uh, peoples who have joined the campaign uh, as an asset, uh, ultimately to sneak up on the Comanches. Uh, they're tr very much trying to uh, avoid giving away their location. And then uh, one final journal entry to consider here. This is on the return, so after the encounter in which Cor uh, Cuerno Verde is killed uh, very near uh, to modern day Pueblo, um, September 5th, which happened to be a Sunday. Um, this entry is probably, uh, was put in very close to what is today San Luis, Colorado. Um, so uh, the reference to the Rio Culebra uh, is, is a reference to the same river that, that bears that name today. Uh, 
the entry reads, at 7.30, we continued south over good terrain, which allowed us to make all of 10 leagues today. Uh, and there's a small typo here, which brought us to the Rio de la Culebra and into the day's march. When we arrived at this place, we found seven dead horses, killed by the ones we attacked on the third. An equal number of corpses, which we guess may have been perished, uh, may have, may have, have I, another typo there, uh, perished in an attack in the Pueblo the Taos, since their trail seems to have uh, come, again, sorry, for, from there. Uh, this same day, before noon, uh, the remaining ones of the Utah tribe, loaded with goods and satisfaction, left for their part of the country without bothering to say goodbye. This lack of attention to the amenities due either to their barbarity or to their eagerness to be back on home ground. Uh, notably, it appears as though many of the Apaches departed either uh, in the Arkansas Valley near modern day Salida uh, or after the encounter with Cuerno Verde uh, on the plains uh, of uh, Colorado. It's more likely, although it's not clear from the documentation when the Ap Apaches broke off, more likely that that, that happened near Salida. Uh, in any event, uh, Anza seems to be rather uh, put off here by the fact that the Utes don't sort of uh, offer him uh, a, a formal leave. Uh, they simply just, simply just depart uh, of their own volition. So again, here we see in a sense that the campaign is not something really under uh, the absolute control of Anza. Uh, parties are entering and leaving this coalition as they see fit. Uh, so in that sense, um, Anza is not so much the leader of this expedition, so much as a kind of broker, uh, a cultural broker between groups uh, trying to build a sort of consensus around this oppositional threat posed by the uh, Comanches uh, to mobilize the common interests of uh, the Spanish uh, and various other indigenous groups against the Comanche. So ultimately, uh, this 1779 uh, trip, uh, trek, uh, campaign, or expedition, whatever you want to call it, into Colorado is somewhat of a success. Um, the documents are not entirely clear, uh, but supposedly Cuerno Verde's headdress is taken back to Santa Fe in triumph. Uh, it's then sent down south all the way to the Viceroy in Mexico City. Some accounts suggest that the Viceroy sends it to King Carlos III, uh, uh, just at this point uh, taking office uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Spain. Uh, it's not clear if uh, the headdress then makes it all the way to the, the Pope. Uh, the, 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 there is some uh, suggestion that maybe it ends up in the Vatican collection, although um, no museum registers that have been consulted uh, reference uh, th this headdress still being in existence, but supposedly it might have ended up all the way in Europe. Uh, in the years that follow, uh, after uh, Cuerno Verde's defeat, um, possibly as many as two-thirds uh, of the Comanches die in a smallpox epidemic, uh, so something uh, to consider as we're going through a, a pandemic of sorts today. Um, smallpox cut through the Comanche ranks, although we only have one source uh, to document this, and that's a, a Spaniard by the name of Pedro Vial, uh, who talks about uh, the after effects uh, of the disease. The disease hit Spanish New Mexico very hard as well, uh, but it is possible that between the combined effects of the encounter at Pueblo and then also owing to smallpox, uh, that the Comanche are put in a position to sue for peace in 1786. Um, before he leaves office, uh, Governor Anza uh, negotiates with the Comanches. There is ultimately at Pecos Pueblo, uh, an agreement uh, that is uh, finalized. Uh, and coming out of that 1786 uh, encounter at Pecos is, is something like a peace that prevails uh, really through the end of the Spanish period. So all, in, all the way until Mexican independence is gained in 1821. So by some measure, the 1779 uh, expedition is successful, not just because it seeks out and uh, kills Cuerno Verde and his, his group, uh, but also because it leads to a period of peaceful relations between the Spanish and the Comanche. Um, although it's worth noting why the Comanche ultimately choose to join in this partnership remains a little bit unclear. They might not have been as afflicted by the smallpox uh, as Spanish records suggest. 
Uh, ultimately, what follows for the Spanish for the next several decades is really the high point uh, of the colonial period, uh, a period of exceptional economic prosperity, uh, really successful trade relationships, not only uh, with the Comanches, but other tribes. And significantly here, and somewhat ironically and maybe tragically from the perspective of the Hikaria Apache, is a new alliance or a new sort of coalition formed between the Comanches and the Spanish who now go on the offensive against the Apaches. So less so the Hikaria Apache, although it's possible that they were targeted as well, but more the Mescalero Apache in southern New Mexico. So the Apache go from being an ally by some measure for the Spanish to being uh, the enemy once again. The Apache had been a pretty uh, powerful force uh, challenging uh, the early history uh, of Spanish New Mexico during the 1600s. Uh, so th the tables by some measure are turned and the Comanches go from being enemies uh, to becoming allies. Um, in conclusion, just some ideas that I wanna put out there and we can certainly talk about uh, these more in the course uh, of the Q&A. Um, I really wanna throw out there, Anza is merely just one of several players here. Uh, we, we tend to title uh, the expedition, the campaign, with his name. Uh, but one of the arguments I, I, I think that is worth putting out there, uh, and one of the things that I hope to make clear as I move from sort of the research page uh, phase of this project into writing about it, uh, is that uh, maybe we shouldn't think of this as something owing to Anza, that this isn't, in a possessive sense, Anza's success, Anza's triumph. But really what we're looking at here is this encounter between different groups who on their own terms are trying to make sense of a shifting lands landscape uh, and, and trying to get the best out of the situation that is possible. In some sense, also at the same time, playing off different groups against one another. Um, the Spanish control then of what is considered to be Spanish New Mexico is really very tenuous, right? The Comanches during this time period really hold the upper hand the only way that the Spanish are able to best the Comanche, it, Comanches are with, uh, or is with the aid uh, of these uh, indigenous allies, the Utes, the Hikaria Apache, and also importantly, the Pueblos. Um, so th this is uh, a, a story in, in which there's actually a lot of indigenous agency. This isn't a story uh, of Europeans coming in and asserting their dominance in the region. Uh, this is rather a, a story in which uh, the, the Spanish are kind of the underdogs, if anything. Uh, indigenous groups are very key players uh, in this story. And ultimately, this is a story uh, of partnerships that are won and lost. These coalitions, these alliances, the, 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 the pieces have to be negotiated. They have to be managed. Uh, it is not something uh, in, in which, again, the Spanish walk in with sort of a superior position and enjoy uh, absolute control uh, of what happens. Uh, ultimately, they're one uh, of many players in this cast of characters. And so I'll stop it there uh, and switch over the Q&A. The, the hope with these kind of uh, Zoom public talks is that we're not going to be speaking uh, for as long as might be the case uh, in a more sort of form formal talk insofar as Zoom isn't quite the same format and we do wanna leave plenty of time for a kind of uh, Q&A. Hey, that's great. Thank you, Nick. Um, so if you do have questions, as Dr. Sine said, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Uh, there is one uh, right now. Rick, I'll, uh, Nick, I'll read that to you. Um, you mentioned that New Mexico is considered by some to be part of the Comancheria. Can you talk more about that? Um, or can you talk more about why and how some people make that claim? Yeah, so um, even before there is a Comancheria, there is an Apacheria. So the, essentially the uh, Western Plains is uh, an area in which the, uh, the, the Apaches, and they go by different names, the Carlanes, the Fareones, uh, are uh, farming and also hunting uh, along uh, essentially what is today uh, the, the open plains uh, of Eastern Colorado, is therefore southward uh, the Comanche move in, um, one scholar famously has called uh, what emerges then a, a Comanche empire. And so they start uh, building uh, a, an imperial presence, though not a very centralized one. They, they remain very detached bands from about the 1750s into the 1850s, largely by raiding Spanish communities to take courses uh, and also trading with the French uh, beginning around the 1740s uh, 
or gun. So it's uh, that combination of the horse uh, and the gun that really propels uh, the Comanche into uh, being such a, a major force to be reckoned with. Um, it, it's not clear who the Comanche were before that. They appear to be a Shoshonean group. So they came out of uh, essentially what is today Northern Wyoming. Uh, some of the tribes in this period talk about them being uh, the snakes. Uh, and so that might be a reference to the Snake River, uh, which runs through uh, Northern Wyoming. Uh, but they move southward and as they do, the, the Spanish sources start talking about this Comancheria. Uh, this bounded space controlled uh, by the Comanche uh, and, and Spanish New Mexico is sort of the uh, western or southern, maybe even southwestern frontier. Um, the Spanish also bound in the Comancheria uh, in Texas as well. So the Comanche are enga engaging both with New Mexico and Texas. Though population estimates place the Spanish uh, in New Mexico as having a lot more people. And so uh, the markets for trade, access to horses are far greater in New Mexico. And so that's ultimately perhaps one of the reasons why the Comanches uh, build up such a present presence uh, in Eastern New Mexico and Eastern Colorado because of their proximity uh, to the Spanish. All right, we have another question. Um, do you have a favorite resource other than the Diary of Ansa? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do uh, as I think about this project is link sort of the, the, the two histories, the two main histories that exist out there. So Anza, from my perspective, has usually been seen uh, as part of either Spanish, uh, especially colonial New Mexican history. And then on the, on the Comanche side, you have sort of more uh, the history of the Comanches. And so these stories kind of intersect at points uh, whereas the, the Anza story that I'm trying to, to situate is more in between those two stories. Um, so Pekka Hamalainen uh, wrote a great book uh, called The Comanche Empire that came out just a few years ago, and I really recommend that for the Comanche perspective on this story. Um, there's another uh, book of, uh, about the Comanches uh, from uh, an individual last name Kavanaugh that is also really great in looking at this early history uh, of the Spanish and the Comanche. Uh, in terms of Anza, uh, not too long ago, there was an excellent biography put out by a scholar named Carlos R. Herrera. Uh, and so that's probably the most recent up-to-date uh, sort of biographical treatment of Anza. And there are really just a multitude of, of works on Spanish uh, colonial New Mexico. So you mentioned the possibility of uh, more than one Cuerno Verde. Uh, there's a question asking, are there actually two, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I, I'm torn on this. I don't really know. Again, it seems as though there is a documented uh, killing of someone who the Spanish refer to in 1768 at Ojo Caliente. And then again, uh, as part of this campaign led by Carlos Fernandez in 1774, there's supposedly another Cuerno Verde. Uh, who, who's killed, although that, that story is partly fictionalized and so it's less credible. Uh, and then there's this 1779 Cuerno Verde. Um, so it's possible maybe that one of these Cuerno Verdes was said to have been killed, but in fact didn't die of uh, injuries and, and so uh, survived to fight another day, so to speak. And so what we might be looking at here uh, is just one Cuerno Verde who dies definitively in 1779, or as many as three. Um, I'm kind of tending towards there being two. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, the fictionalized account in 1774 did not actually uh, offer a, a very accurate retelling. And so uh, that Cuerno Verde did not die in 1774 and is the one who reappears around the same place, geographically speaking, uh, in 1779. But there's no really firm way to know this. Um, it's also the case that um, we might have the same leader who is taking the headdress uh, and putting it on. And so the Spanish are identifying the headdress more so than the individual. Um, there's not really a, a succession by blood in the Comanche tradition. And so it's unlikely that we have someone of the same familial lineage uh, that is succeeding into office when uh, the, the previous Cuerno they died. But that, that's one of the mysteries of this story. So just to follow up to the Cuerno Verde question, there's a question uh, about whether he was referenced as dangerous man. Does that sound 
familiar? Yeah, so um, there is a later source from 1812 uh, by a, a resident of Santa Fe, uh, Pedro uh, Bautista Pino, uh, and he writes uh, a, a tract actually for uh, authorities in Spain where he talks about this 1779 event, and he gives the name of Puerto Verde as Davido Narillante, uh, which is a little bit closer probably to the, the actually, actual Comanche pronunciation. Uh, you know, exactly how close that is to Comanche is unclear, uh, but uh, the, the best guess is translating Tavivo Narillante into Comanche, you get this name uh, that, that was alluded to just a moment ago. So we have different names, right? So um, we, we have this uh, Comanche name from Pedro Bautista Pino, uh, Tavivo Narillante, we have Cuerno Verde, and then in English we also have greenhorn. These are all the same people, essentially, uh, being referenced in different linguistic traditions. All right, so we have a question from Carlos. He's asking, what are some of the spoils uh, that attracted the indigenous allies to join the Spanish? Yeah, so I, I think more, more so than spoils, it was really an opportunity to try to stave off the threat of the Comanche. Uh, Anza claims that there's a lot of discussion about spoils, uh, and I, also, I honestly don't know that there would have been a lot of, of spoils um, beyond sort of the, the reputation uh, at an individual level that would come from success on, on the battlefield. Um, the, the, the Utes and the Apaches are probably more likely having a conversation with the Spanish uh, over spoils as a way to have this conversation about who's in control and who holds the upper hand here. And ultimately the decision is that essentially uh, there's an equal partnership here. Um, there, there are references to the headdress being taken, to horses being taken, uh, but in terms of the number of people in this combined Spanish uh, Ute and Apache party, versus the number of uh, Comanches, that there would not have been a lot of spoil to go around, all, all be told. And I, I think most people would have been uh, aware of that. So there are several questions, um, including one from Rosalia asking about, uh, you had referencing the Henisaro involvement. Can you talk about that or maybe what some of the references are that identify individuals as Henisaro? Yeah, so again, one, one of the ways in which the um, Henisaro uh, history is described is, is as these people are either Hispanized Indians or Christianized Indians. So what's happening uh, in this time period and, and well before and well after is that we have different uh, indigenous groups and also the Spanish uh, complicit in slave trading. Uh, and so uh, Typically, women and children are being brought into the fold of Spanish New Mexico through a process known as rescate or ransom. Uh, and so the Spanish are essentially claiming to uh, baptize these slaves, uh, make them no longer slaves. Truth be told, they're, they're still treated as slaves within uh, Spanish New Mexico. Uh, these persons, as the generations sort of proliferate, are never fully accepted within the fold of Spanish society. And, can't easily return to uh, their indigenous communities. Uh, and so what, what emerges is sort of this group that occupies an interstitial space between uh, the Spaniards and the various indigenous groups. They are typically settled on the periphery uh, of Spanish New Mexico. So in places uh, on the west uh, like Abiquiu and also Ojo Caliente, uh, we know that the Comanches attack Ojo Caliente in, seven, in the 1740s and the 1750s. Ojo Caliente is repeatedly uh, settled and then abandoned uh, and settled and abandoned. The same thing happens with Abiquiu. So these are persons who are really put on the periphery in the hopes that they can interact with indigenous peoples better than the Spanish can. Uh, but are also kind of sacrificed to, to the Comanche. And so it appears as though some of these groups are uh, most excited about joining uh, this campaign because ultimately the, the Comanches pose the greatest threat to the long-term settlement uh, of Henisaros within the context uh, of the Spanish colonial experiment. experiment. Hmm. Let's see, so you mentioned religion. Uh, Wayne asks an interesting question. He says, with the different groups working together, can you talk about how the different religious beliefs were part of, ignored, or created conflict during the travels? 
Yeah, so if there was a lot of conflict at a religious level, uh, it's not alluded to in uh, the journal. Uh, and so uh, we don't have a, a, a lot of information on, on that front. Uh, you know, in terms of what the Spanish think they're doing with the indigenous population uh, differs from, from probably the reality over the time, right? So the Spanish uh, are very hopeful that they're going to be able to make uh, what they consider to be uh, thorough uh, Catholic converts uh, of not only the Pueblos, but certainly the Hikaria uh, Apache, who they believe have sort of accepted uh, protection in, in exchange for conversion, uh, but also some of these other groups uh, as well. Um, the extent to which these groups actually fully adopt uh, Catholicism varies from, from Pueblo to Pueblo and from uh, indigenous group to indigenous group. Uh, I would say more often than not, what we see emerging are various, and I stress various, syncretic traditions. So that is uh, religious belief systems in which we see uh, a melding of uh, Catholic and traditional uh, beliefs. Uh, in many cases as well, uh, what these indigenous groups are good at doing is playing off the Spanish to show that uh, outwardly, uh, say when the friars come to visit, that they can put off the airs of being Catholic, but once the friars are gone, can return to practicing what they consider to be the, the old uh, and the more authentic uh, religious beliefs. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, let's see, Karen has a question. She asks if you can speak more about the Apaches leaving the group near Salida. Uh, she asks if the Apaches uh, lived near that area at the time. Uh, no, so they, they did not at that time live near there. Uh, however, so, so if you're in Salida and you're trying to return to uh, the new Apache homeland, uh, there are two options to you, right? You can, you can go, cutting away from Salida southward uh, in two directions. Uh, one would be to, to cut through uh, the mountainous area uh, and remember the time of year. Uh, it's not as though the mountain passes are impassable. You can get through them in this time period. Um, uh, and so it appears as though they broke away around Salida Buena Vista to, to cut through the mountains to avoid encountering the Comanche on their return. Uh, if they had gone eastward into the open plains, they almost surely would have been isolated in small numbers and, and cut down. Uh, Anza really doesn't go into too much detail, but he says that there's a group uh, that is sort of dissatisfied with the partnership and breaks off. Uh, at around the crossing uh, of the Arkansas River. Uh, and he's kind of perturbed by this, um, which is kind of interesting. He, if there's some slight that he commits on his part, he doesn't fess up to it in the journal. Um, it, it's possible here that we have one of those uh, moments of cultural misunderstanding uh, where one uh, person does something that is misinterpreted by another. Uh, but in any event, uh, part of that band of 200 people that join around what is today uh, Antonito, Colorado, leave uh, at around uh, the Arkansas River. And then another group break off uh, at another point uh, near Pueblo. Uh, Anza documents the 200 but then he never really says the number of people, uh, a number of uh, individuals as they break off at later points. And so it's not clear who is leaving when uh, and also uh, how many they number. So Nick, there's another um, Henisaro question. Um, question about whether Henisaro's settled Conejos. Yes, I, I, so, the short answer is yes. So uh, Conejos and the Conejos land grant was settled by persons who moved upward or upward, uh, northward uh, from towns like El Rito, O Caliente, and Abiquiu. Uh, that connection is, is pretty clear. Uh, and so you have uh, those communities, like I mentioned a moment ago, being settled by Henisaros. So uh, their descendants ultimately are the ones who move northward. Now, uh, Conejos is not settled until probably the late 1840s. Um, it, it definitively shows up in the records as Conejos in the early 1850s. Uh, so we're talking of a gap there on the order of about 70 years. So uh, we have several generations after uh, the story that I just told uh, that uh, sees that area resettled. Uh, and then if eventually those persons start to migrate northward looking for more pasturage for sheep uh, and also new uh, grounds for, for things like hunting and fishing and so on. Mm 
All right, we've got probably time for just a couple more questions. Um, Manuel asks an interesting question. He says, a you elder friend of mine told me that it is not customary to say goodbye when parting under the assumption that people would meet again, either in this world or the next. Maybe the failure to say goodbye during the parting during the expedition was not a snub, but a case of cultural misunderstanding. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, so I have heard that as well. And I think that is absolutely probably what's going on here. Um, so, you know, kind of uh, one of the challenges for a historian is, uh, is that we tend to look at uh, written sources first. Uh, and doing that uh, gives the Spanish side of the equation uh, more, more, more sort of privilege in, in terms of how we, we frame the event. So just looking at Anza's journal, remember he talks about kind of being bothered and offended by this happening, doesn't capture both sides of the story here. Uh, so my hope as I move through this project with more research is to uh, use some uh, oral testimony, some oral history, and bring in more of the uh, indigenous side of the story. Uh, so I, I have heard that. Um, one thing that's curious, though, from my perspective, is that uh, the, the Spanish have had interactions uh, with the Utes and the Apaches and the Pueblos for a long time by this point. Uh, so they, they, shouldn't, they, they shouldn't, in a sense, know better than to take it as a snub. Uh, and yet that's, that's how Anza pretty much refers to it in the journal. Um, there could be a few things going on there, right? So Anza's probably not actually the one keeping the journal. It's the, the scribe, a notary who goes with him. Uh, so maybe actually what we're seeing there is uh, that person's voice come through. Uh, remember, Anza hasn't been in, hadn't been in the region for very long. Uh, so whereas he was familiar with the customs of, say, the, the Yuma uh, in Arizona from his treks into California, uh, the, the Utes and the Apaches, although they had been well known to the Spanish long before this point in time, uh, culturally are still relatively new to him. Uh, and so what we might be seeing there is him really for the first time interacting with uh, these groups uh, and trying to make sense of them. And uh, his go-to sort of reaction is that this is offensive behavior. Uh, we have to wonder then, after 10 years of being uh, in, in Spanish New Mexico, uh, if his outlook on, on some of these cultural practices uh, changed or if he, if he stuck to his sort of old uh, interpretation of interactions. And then we have a question from our friend Bob in, uh, at Fort Francisco actually, just on the other side of, of uh, La Vida Pass. Um, Bob asks, any research uh, that reveals the actual battle location of Pueblo, uh, Burnt Mill Road, Colorado City? Uh, uh, no. Um, in fact, the, the last uh, time that there was an effort to try and locate the, the battlefield, I believe, was in the 1970s, from what I've been able to find. Uh, so the Spanish accounts focus on saying that there were so many leagues marched. Uh, and so using a, a league, which in, in that time period is a very rough approximation, right? This is before satellite imaging technology um, th th that doesn't allow a lot of precision in terms of locating uh, the battlefield. Um, there is a, a description of it being along the San Carlos River uh, at a bend. Uh, so it kind of seems as though the Spanish kind of pin the Comanches up against um, sort of an, an earthen bend where the river uh, turns. Uh, but anyone who's been out there to see that river knows that it meanders back and forth along uh, a sort of canyon uh, channel. Um, it, it's possible that that river might have moved a little bit here and there since 1779, though it, it probably hasn't moved much. Uh, but exactly where the battle site is located remains uh, undiscovered. Uh, and so for all we know, someone's house might be built uh, very much on top of it today. There, there might be uh, cows grazing in an open field right now, um, or, or it might be, you know, in a relatively undisturbed spot, which for uh, anthropologists uh, to go and, uh, and do an archaeological uh, site reconnaissance would be marvelous, but um, we haven't uncovered the battlefield. I I'm personally not too interested in the battlefield. Um, if we were to find it, there would probably be some really valuable artifacts to be uncovered, uh, though I think some of the sources we have and some of the information uh, that is available uh, already shares uh, sheds a lot of a lot of light on this encounter. So um, as tempting as it would be to sort of delve into the military aspects of the engagement, uh, I'm trying to stay a little bit more in the realm of the cultural encounter and understanding how these groups uh, come together. Great. Hey, that this is great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm gonna 
take the screen back so that we can conclude. Thanks, Eric. Um,